hello class, we're going to continue our discussion of this chapter on science, a way of knowing. In the previous two chapters, we talked about mathematics and units of measurements, including the metric system. In this video lesson, we're going to talk about the scientific method. That is, this formal process that describes how science is done in the most ideal sense. Actually, science can occur in a lot of different ways. But we like to refer back to this very formal way in which science can be done or should be done. And that involves the following steps, an iterative stepwise process, an attempt to understand some natural phenomena. It usually starts with an observation or in which a scientist is trying to explain or understand some natural behavior, natural phenomena. And in doing this, the scientist will generally devise a hypothesis. A hypothesis is an educated guess on how something operates or how the phenomena behaves or what the basis is for a phenomena. The next step is experimentation or observational test of a hypothesis, followed by the evaluation of one's results. And then these results would generally either support the hypothesis or refute the hypothesis. Of course, if your hypothesis is refuted, in particular, you would refine the hypothesis and perform additional experimental or observational tests of the hypothesis. That is an iterative process. Repeat the steps until an understanding is achieved. So you observe phenomena, come up with an educated guess or hypothesis of what the basis for the phenomena is, and experimentally test that hypothesis. Evaluate the results, revise, etc., until understanding is achieved. So that's the basic steps in the scientific method. In this slide, I show four important terms that are used with respect to the scientific method hypothesis, model, theory, and law, which in some sense may seem like they overlap or they mean some they mean maybe the same thing, but actually they have distinct meaning. A hypothesis is a conjecture, an educated guess about how something works. And hypotheses are what we will try to test in order to further understand uh, the basis for a process. When a scientist achieves some level of understanding of a natural process, he or she may develop a model for that process. A model is often a visual depiction of how phenomena works or some logical framework. Almost think of that as a cartoon or a drawing of how something operates. If a model is supported by studies by other scientists and if it withstands many challenges or many tests over time and can explain a wide variety of observations, it might eventually become what is called a theory. A theory, an extensive explanation of a phenomenon or related phenomena that are supported by a vast body of evidence and has withstood repeated challenges or repeated tests. I like to describe a theory as a grand explanation. And the fourth term on the list is law. A law is generally a short pithy statement or an equation that summarizes the behavior of a natural system. So if you might think of an equation, these are some equations you don't need to know, but F equals MA, force is mass times acceleration. We'll see that a little later. PV equals NRT. You've probably heard of E equals MC squared. Those would be scientific laws or a statement of Newton's laws. Now, notice that the terms hypothesis and theory have different meanings. In our ordinary discourse, people oftentimes interchange the terms hypothesis and theory. And in fact, there's usually a tendency to use the word theory more often than hypothesis, when in fact, one really probably means hypothesis. I did a little Google search, and there are like six times as many uh, hits on the phrase, it's my theory, much more than it's my hypothesis. As we said to a scientist, a theory means a grand explanation. It's, like, it's something like the theory of gravity. Whereas a hypothesis is a guess or a preliminary explanation or a possible proposed explanation. Actually, we'll see a little later that there are relatively few theories. And in fact, if you had a room full of scientists, it's likely that not a single one has been the author of a theory. Yet, 
if you had a room full of political pundits or journalists or politicians, as soon as the cameras go on, everyone has a theory. It's just the different uses of the term. And you can see that that may lead to some confusion between a scientist who has a separate definition or understanding of the term theory and hypothesis versus a, a non-scientist who might have a different understanding where their terms hypothesis and theory might be interchanged. Just remember that when you're talking to a scientist, if they use the word theory, they oftentimes mean it with a capital T, like the theory of gravity, the grand explanation. As I said, theories are few and, and important. There are the theories related to classical mechanics, the theory of relativity, quantum theory, the Big Bang theory, theory of gravity, theory of electromagnetism. In the area of chemistry, there's atomic theory, kinetic theory of gases, molecular orbital theory, transition state theory, etc. In biology, there's cell theory, the theory of evolution, germ theory, and, and in geosciences, there would be the plate tectonic theory and climate change theory. But this is actually a relatively short list of capital T theories. In this class and the second semester of this course, we will actually go over most of these theories. In this slide, I want to talk about some characteristics of the scientific method. The performance of science generally is a collaborative process. Scientists rarely work by themselves. They oftentimes work in groups and collaborate with one another. One of the hallmarks of science is reproducibility. That is, if a scientist is making some measurements, he or she will want to be able to determine whether or not they can repeat that measurement so that they can then trust the value. So reproducibility is important. In the last set of lectures, we talked about precision and accuracy and in errors. So scientists are very much concerned about their ability to reproduce their measurements. Another characteristic of, of science is that there is an open dialogue in the sharing of data and results. Scientists often go to scientific meetings and they talk to each other and they give papers and they share their results because this is a way of actually uh, verifying and testing data. Science also is characterized by the use of logical reasoning processes, both inductive and deductive uh, logic, and the use of mathematical tools, as we've said earlier and the reliance on measurements and various quantitative measurements. In addition, the scientific method is an objective approach to trying to understand natural phenomena. Scientists must be open-minded, but they also must have a healthy dose of skepticism. That is, they want to make sure that they can trust results. They are oftentimes skeptical of not only their own results, but results produced by others. And this skepticism is actually can be very healthy in the way science is done. Scientists have to also be unbiased in their studies. A scientist should not approach a study already having an outcome predetermined. A scientist has to be willing to be open-minded and be able to accept any outcome. Also in conducting science, ethics is very important. That is, when a scientist carries out experiments and reports results, he or she has to be honest and ethical in that reporting. In particular, if the research a scientist is doing is funded by the federal government, by taxpayers, then we all have an interest in that person being honest and being ethical in their research and in their reports. Also, the scientific method is characterized by its use of controls and variables independent and dependent variables, and attention to sample size. This gets into concepts of research design, which we will not go into a great deal, but the point is that there are some characteristics of the way good science is done. And also I wanted to add Occam's razor, which is sometimes referred to as the KISS principle. You all know the KISS principle, right? Keep it simple, stupid. That is, in interpreting scientific results, Occam's razor says that you should always try to come up with the simplest interpretation that will explain the results, not some elaborate, unnecessarily complicated interpretation. Keep it simple, stupid. Let me show you a slide which I think is kind of interesting because it depicts some of the ways that scientists use uh, controls and variables. 
on the left, and this is a, is a slide that comes from a textbook that we may be using, you see an array of plots on, in a field. The experiment that is being done is that the scientist is varying the amount of fertilizer components, phosphates and potassium and, and nitrogen, in the different squares and determining which plants will thrive and whether or not plants in certain of these plots subjected to certain fertilizer treatments can survive better in certain climates or certain temperatures. You notice the array and the way that the scientist is setting up a sets of variables having different fertilizer in the different plots. And this type of study done by someone perhaps in the field of agriculture or botany can be similar in many ways to an experiment designed by a chemist where we tend to use test tubes, where each test tube might contain a different amount of some chemical. Also, it brings to my mind, this is an overhead view of the biological field station, which is just 15 miles or so away from the university. And you'll notice in the bottom part of this photograph, a set of squares. These squares are actually ponds. And notice how the ponds form an array very similar to the array of test tubes or the array of plots in the field where scientists can study various variables placed into these different ponds. And if you blow this up to a higher altitude, you can see that only that first set of ponds, in the, which is now in the upper part of this diagram, but you can see there are other larger ponds and a whole string of ponds in this field station. Wanted to mention a few other things about the scientific process. And the first is the importance of peer review. In conducting science, the way we affirm our results is by publishing them in journals. It's pretty dry reading most of the time. But what is important is the peer review process. For a scientist to publish an article of his or her finding, that article is reviewed by other scientists in the field who read the article and make a recommendation as to whether or not it's worthy of being published. So in doing science, the results are always reviewed by other people in the field. This is a consensus building process so that if certain results withstand both this peer review and repeated experiments by other scientists, sometimes experiments attempting to challenge the results of the scientists, that is the body of the evidence, the research results themselves will lead to a consensus. And so scientific models and laws and theories are constantly being reviewed and challenged and tested over time by scientists, sometimes leading to revisions. In this course we'll give a number of examples of how our understanding of nature Certain theories that were that existed at one time, where certain theories were revised and updated and sometimes replaced by other theories. That's the way science is done. It is a consensus building and iterative process, always subject to review. Okay, we'll pause again for a quiz. And then we'll come back and talk about various branches of science. See you in a while.